thank you. Red, um, I'm Simon and I'm pretty much a language snob. I'm also a frequent Lisp evangelist and yet I have JavaScript in the title of my talk. So what could possibly go wrong? Now, granted, there are some things that we do need to acknowledge. JavaScript is amazingly ubiquitous. It's basically everywhere. It also can be surprisingly fast, especially with things like V8 and so forth. And that's already kind of an interesting combination, having something that's ubiquitous and yet fast. But unfortunately, it's also quite shit. Um, so, and I think like here, yes, we can just kind of laugh about the various uh, not so well thought out design trade-offs that um, people behind JavaScript made. But I think that there's also kind of a wider point here to be made. And yes, I just love this animation. Uh, which is that um, this, is some, this is something that's not just unique to JavaScript. It's, kind of, it's very easy to point fingers and make fun of it. But it's like we could also, also leverage kind of the same critique to PHP, Go, Python, Visual Basic. Like all those la these languages are, on the one hand, are amazing because they're very approachable. And people can just pick them up and try tinkering with them, hacking with them, building something. Uh, but on the other hand, it does also have a downside, which is that it te those kind of languages and the ecosystems built around them tend to build up technical depth at a much faster pace and to a much greater extent than languages which maybe are kind of designed with more thought up front. And but I think it's, kind of a, it's a kind of healthy dynamic that we have this kind of expansions and a reactionary pullback or rather kind of someone coming up and solving those problems. Uh, and this is also like why I'm talking about this. It's not just to... Um, make fun of JavaScript, although we, I will be making some fun of JavaScript, but also because I think it's an important point to think about how we can kind of overcome this and still kind of leverage all the power that comes from having a widely available platform and how to kind of work around its deficiencies. So kind of in ideal situation, we would want to kind of retain all the benefits of JavaScript, but none of the bad parts. And what we can do here is to actually kind of just compile the JavaScript. So instead of programming JavaScript, we use JavaScript as a target for our compiler. And this is an approach that's now becoming more and more in vogue. So the idea is you take source code in some nice language, you compile it or transpile it, and you get out JavaScript. This can be done kind of basically in two ways. Either you just kind of generate JavaScript and you're done with it with no kind of runtime, or it can be kind of a properly bootstrapped and then self-hosted environment, uh, which is kind of more or less the same as you'd have in a normal, probably dynamic language. Um, and we're going to look at kind of examples of both and what are the trade-offs. So kind of the three languages that um, we're going to look at today are going to be ClojureScript, Elm, and PureScript. Now, I do kind of have to emphasize this talk is in no way trying to kind of teach you how to program in those languages. There's, an, there's going to be almost no code. What my goal for today here is that I kind of provide you as a starting point for your own explorations, for your own experimentations, and maybe even if I'm audacious, a starting point for your thinking. So let's get started. First of all, kind of obviously closure script, because as I said, I am a Lisp Winnie, so we will be starting with a Lisp dialect. Um, concretely, kind of closure script is a dialect of closure, which is a Lisp running on JVM. Uh, that means it's dy dynamically typed, mostly um, kind of Fun kind of functional, um, mutable, la immutable language. Um, and Clojure script is kind of a, has an interesting relation to Clojure proper because it's kind of mostly interoperable. There are some kind of pieces where just the JavaScript runtime is so vastly different than the JVM that they aren't kind of entirely compatible. And there are also obviously differences in the libraries you work alongside with. But it's still kind of, it's one of, in, it provides a pretty good um, implementation of this idea that you kind of write one code and then run it on different platforms. Um, it's also an example of a bootstrapped and self-hosted language runtime, meaning that like you have a Clojure script compiler written in Clojure or Clojure script itself, which you compile and then you kind of evaluate code as your environment. And this gets included in uh, when running into your, for instance, your browser. But um, this now might seem like quite a wasteful approach because um, you kind of have the entire language runtime, but this is, but Clojure Script uses Google's Clojure compiler, and this is now going to be hilarious because two things sound more or less the same, but rather kind of different, which is essentially a core library pl plus a JavaScript compiler that does things like tree shaking and so forth. So actually, um, the code that's being that's produced by the Clojure Script compiler is not that horrendously 
um, big or inefficient as it might seem. No, but like, wha what makes it special? Just that it's a dialect of closure in itself is not so much. But what this means is that it brings kind of three key things. Um, there's a huge emphasis on concurrency and state management. And this is something that, like, if you look at most of the bugs in your program, are going to tend to be something around state management or even concurrency. And Clojure is kind of designed upfront to solve those problems. The other very strong point of Clojure, and most lips, lisps that, for that matter, is that they are probably unparalleled in terms of how well they can manipulate data. And the last point is the kind of the lisp special source, which is called homoeconomy, meaning that basically the co code equals data, and this allows you also to kind of use macros to um, extend your language. Now, with homoeconomy, what I mean is that if you look at those kind of two pieces of code, the above the first one is actually closure code, and the lower example are just closure data structures. And you will note that they look more or less the same, where they are the same, because the entire code is essentially just build out of the data structure that's already in Clojure. So essentially, you're kind of directly programming by writing out your abstract syntax tree. And as we said, kind of Clojure is good at manipulating such structures, where you have this combination of lisps and vectors and so forth. So what's kind of natural is that we might want to work with this. And kind of in the Lisp world, we call this macros. So the idea is that at the point where your, your code gets evaluated, you can actually leverage the full power of your runtime Lisp, but working on the kind of code that has been, uh, that's been evaluated. So if we, look, we said here previously that like, this is just, they, like the functions here are just data structures, so we can actually manipulate them as data structures and provide kind of different code. And this is, turns out to be amazingly powerful. Um, so for instance, you have Lisp systems with closure where things like an optional gradual typing system is just an extension of the language, but once you use it, it looks like it's kind of baked in from the start. Closure got kind of its async library, which is kind of similar to Go routines, again, just as a library, and it looks like it's a part, core part of a language. And this is why you also kind of oftentimes see that Lisps tend to be kind of at the forefront of uh, new language features. Like oftentimes, a new feature will come along, and then there's going to be some very bearded old school hacker who's going to say, oh, but we had this in Lisp in the 70s. And it actually is like that because it's just so simple to extend the language. So it's kind of natural when you're working with Lisp, you're thinking through um, extending language. Now, the other kind of plus that you get from this is that um, because ClojureScript being completely self-hosted is that you have an amazingly dynamic uh, environment. And so basically, with Lisps, you would oftentimes have, or like the predominant way of developing is going to be kind of REPL based. So it's going to kind of constant iterative stream. And this kind of really works really well also in the browser or even in iOS or something like that if you're using something like React Native. Um, and this, this is a very important point because it kind of changes the way you approach so problem, solve uh, problem solving. Suddenly, it, kind of, it blurs the line between your environment on the one hand and kind of the code that you're using to solve a problem on the other. And so it's kind of solving the problem for two, from two ends, building tools and solving kind of the problem within those tools. Uh, so what, uh, in kind of this, as a digression, which I kind of always kind of like and really clarify a lot of my thinking around programming languages is that you fundamentally have two ways of how to approach problem solving with computers or programming. One is sort of the language paradigm, the other is the systems paradigm. With the language paradigm, it's basically kind of the more mathematical way where you start up front with your axioms or your type definitions, and then they kind of provide the boundaries of your system, and you move within those boundaries and try to kind of prove different things and with that solve problems. The other approach, the system paradigm, is basically built around the notion that you are interacting with a live complex system. And what you do is kind of slowly nip at the problem from different perspectives, from different sides, and then slowly build towards a solution, but always kind of focusing on this constant iteration loop around it. So maybe you could say that on the one hand, you kind of have this um, duality between discovery and invention. Uh, and it turns out that it's kind of, people are obviously kind of wired differently and to some kind of are more attuned with the language paradigm way of thinking. And for some of us, it's more the system paradigm. And that's why I also think like why I've stayed, like even though I'm, I love to experiment with different languages, but I always keep coming back to Lisps is because I kind of mesh the best with the way I think.
So um, as I said, with, 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 and how I think, or how I solve problems, and I think it's kind of oftentimes an overlooked approach is to really kind of start very unambitious, just kind of use a toy example of your problem, simplify it to the maximum, try to solve that, and then kind of slowly work by um, transforming your problem in kind of simpler and simpler forms. So it's kind of approach from different sides and working towards like, orchestrating that at some point you come to a solution and the whole thing kind of works. But the, for this, it's like in some language environments, this would be incredibly tedious. This is something that can only be done in a very, very um, dynamic environment when you can get that constant feedback so that you can start solving the problem with kind of small bits and pieces and work around them. Okay. So to change gears, um, because there are some other kind of cool approaches that can come with more advanced languages, is let's talk about Elm for a bit. Um, now, Elm is quite the opposite of what ClojureScript is. It's probably much smaller as a language. Uh, it's statically typed and very strict. You can't have nulls. You can't have undefined. You can't have runtime exceptions. So it's quite strict in this kind of ML bondage sense. Um, it's obviously functional and pure, which kind of goes well with being statically typed. It compiles to JavaScript, but because it has a kind of a very specific way of working, uh, its interoperability with its host system, meaning J JavaScript, is kind of limited. But what makes it special, and why we're kind of today talking about it, is that uh, it's kind of very, very focused into being a tool for, build, for building front end. So it's almost kind of like they're willing at some points to sacrifice some of the kind of this general appeal by being laser focused on building the entire kind of user interface. Um, it's optimized for kind of for um, simplicity and for friendliness. It's actually it has amazing error messages. And I know it kind of sounds like why am I talking about error messages with one of the high points? But it's really like it makes such a huge difference if you see when you see how good an error message can be, especially when you're leveraging the type system to provide kind of very useful and very actionable hints. Um, it has like also kind of other interesting quirks like its package system enforces semantic versioning, and it's kind of reactive by design. So you, Again, it's very opinionated, so you don't kind of have much leeway in terms of how you architecture your application, but its approach, kind of this model, update, view, reactive way of doing things, turns out to be um, quite a good fit for what's it, what it's built for, meaning like single, um, single page applications and so forth. So the idea here with, this, with its reactive nature is uh, that essentially you want the program to be a fewer function uh, which uh, kind of simplifies development, testing, and so forth. So if you have just pure functions, you also like, you don't even need integration tests, to be honest. Um, but again, re real life does mean that we will have to use state in some way or shape. Um, and how Elm does this is it actually kind of separates the two. So you, your code is basically our pure functions that you can think of that are kind of running on a loop of your data. It's kind of, your data is constantly passed around, and all the side effects are actually kind of pulled out into the language runtime layer, and you can, where you can manipulate them much better. Now, in um, Elm speak, it's called kind of mailboxes, which are what kind of incorporates your state. And you can think of it like a good analogy I use to kind of work what's going on is that this is sort of simple, same thing as you'd have when you're decoupling reads from writes by using something like a Kafka or a message bus. Here kind of the fundamental idea behind signals in Elm is the same, that you have kind of a <coughs> this log of all the state changes that happened, so you actually have mutability, but yet still kind of the system can progress through different phases. And this turns out to be a very good way of structuring your applications and thinking about state. And as pre previously, when I was mentioning all those various nice error messages, they are really nice and really helpful. And this is something that I think it's kind of oftentimes overlooked. This is also said like one of the more, one of the downsides, for instance, of closure that we have pretty bad um, error messages, but these are kind of just simply beautiful and shows like how far you can push things like that and how can you leverage uh, the type system to be not just something that enforces verification, but also like a, an actual helper in the way you develop things. Now, speaking of type systems, let's go kind of full on into this. Pure script, and here because um, let's alienate also the functional programmers in the room when I've already alienated JavaScript programmers, is you'd say that probably kind of a more clean and more modern Haskell. Now, why I say this is that it's kind of, it's again, it compiles to JavaScript, doesn't have any runtime, but can inter interoperate with its host system quite nicely. And 
it's also like it's not just it doesn't target just JavaScript, but it also has backends for uh, Erlang's visual, uh, virtual machine and C++ and so forth. And it's actually just kind of a very nice little self-contained language. They took most kind of lessons with Haskell and its type system and kind of cleaned it up and made it nicer. Most of the things that it can do in terms of what its type system can do can also be done obviously in Haskell, but they tend to be kind of you need language extensions and so forth, and kind of pure script is just nicely refought the same thing. Um, at the same time, it's also kind of, it's not as um, maybe web-focused uh, web as the previous examples, but it's more like a general purpose, almost kind of a back-end language that just, tends to, just happens to use JavaScript as its runtime. Um, one thing that's kind of maybe problematic is that uh, it has a pretty steep learning curve. Like most people will tell you that, oh, first learn some Haskell and then progress to PureScript, which is not ideal if you aren't really kind of versed in that. But it's kind of very interesting because it kind of it demonstrates what kind of things you can, how far you can push type systems and what they can provide for you. For instance, like here are a couple of examples, um, and I'm just kind of cover the idea behind it. You can do things like making sure that you can't have um, someone who is not uh, authenticated viewing some form of resource, and this can be enforced by your type system, rather than kind of having various checks and validations, but it's something that will actually not compile if you aren't explicit about your authentication handling. You can also use leverage type system to make sure that you don't have broken links. Uh, it can also can nicely to build up on other less strict languages like SQL and so forth, and provide you with useful hints and checking and things like that. Um, so kind of Using type systems to this degree is something that kind of takes some time to fully work. But when you do, I think like there are some domain problems where it's an excellent, excellent fit. Sometimes it, at least to me, it doesn't kind of seem the most natural way of doing things, where it kind of seems sort of a complication for its own sake. But if sometimes it can solve your core domain problem in an amazingly elegant way, or can make sure that. Uh, the most kind of problematic and mission critical part of your code is actually kind of correct as it needs to be. So, why should you care about all this? Or, or what are the kind of the things I want you to take away from this talk? First one is that um, we should always strive to look for better tools for pop. Um, yes, JavaScript is a very general purpose language, almost kind of to a fault. So it oftentimes makes more sense to look for a slightly more specialized language and which is a better fit for your domain and a better fit for your thinking about this domain and how to solve problems. And that can have kind of amazing leverage. You know that I love that quote from Alan Kay that a change in perspective is worth 80 IQ points. And I think the kind of using a different tool is precisely that. It kind of changes your perspective to something else and your focus on something different. So one is tooling. Now, um, some of these languages are much, much nicer to build toolings against. For instance, like we've already seen with Closure Script or, uh, that there is this n no clear delineation between your environment or the tools that you're using and the language itself. And it's very easy to manipulate. Or with having a very a good type system also allows you to do various types of static analysis that otherwise might be quite hard to do. So again, more specialized languages or just uh, languages with smaller surface area oftentimes allow you to build much better tools than if you have the kind of most general thing that has to support some legacy devices and God knows what. So, so like, let's face it, the, um, the, idea, the notion that of having the same language on the front end, on the back end, is actually kind of rather a good idea. It's just that JavaScript is not kind of maybe the best choice to do that. But the general idea is solid because it kind of Obviously, it, it greatly reduces things like code duplication. Um, it helps you with validation. Oftentimes, you're gonna have a better match of how the front-end and back-end communicate and so forth. All those are kind of very good ideas um, that kind of should be used, but please, for God's sakes, don't use the node. For instance, like here's an example in ClojureScript, where um, Onyx is a kind of a parallel stream processing uh, framework, something like similar to Spark, but built in Clojure. And because it's written in Clojure, it turns out that its main runtime can also run in Clojure script. So what we have here is actually a simulator which runs in your browser and simulates how your parallel processing pipeline is going to work and can do this in real time. 
And this is a tool that would be immensely, immensely hard to write for something like Spark or something where you have to duplicate so much functionality. And here, it just basically, because it's closure on both sides, you can just build it and build a nice interactive interface around it. Um, and last but not least, um, target kind of it. This approach can shore up deficiencies in your main or your favorite language. For instance, Clojure being a JVM language is not particularly fast to start up, so it's not very good for scripting. But if we use Clojure script with something like Node, it can be made to run very fast and suddenly you can use it for scripting. Um, maybe um, Amazon Lambda or something doesn't support your favorite language. Well, it does support JavaScript. So if you can target JavaScript, you can have, again, the same language running on Lambda. Um, it also kind of opens a much wider variety of libraries in terms of all the various NPM packages and so forth, again, kind of helping to solve the chicken and egg problem that new languages have. And uh, last but not least, it can, can then run on platforms you would never imagine. Like um, doing mobile with a completely interactive wrapper, like you've seen in ClojureScript, is a very profound experience. So, um, and kind of to close it off, it's not just kind of JavaScript. This is an approach that can, that supposed to can be leveraged, for instance, to target uh, Erlang, um, virtual machine, we already mentioned PureScript, there's also things like Elixir and um, Erlang flavored Lisp and so forth. So it's an approach that has married beyond just the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, and I think we're going to see much more of this in the future as these various kind of platforms mature and it makes more and more sense to kind of leverage them rather than always building up from scratch. Now, on this point, and because we still have a couple of minutes left, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, Um, I think that many of these projects kind of predate WebAssembly, so it's just kind of a historical thing. I know that uh, people behind ClojureScript are experimenting with WebAssembly somewhat, but also it's just kind of a complexity that it's still much nicer to build something that targets JavaScript properly, which is still kind of a high-level high language. And many of these projects start kind of as small, but I would kind of expect that we're going to see more of that in the coming years as WebAssembly kind of gains more foothold. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Do you use uh, the, the few languages that you mentioned uh, in your day job, or are they more of a pet project? Uh, I, we use ClojureScript because we're very invested in Clojure, so it's gonna, it made sense. Um, or, but if I was going to start a project from scratch um, and wouldn't be kind of using Clojure in the back end, I would give Elm of a very serious look. Yes. I don't know it very well, to be honest, but um, I rather, maybe this is also kind of my opinion that it doesn't seem to stand out in any kind of particular niche so that it would be kind of worth investigating or interesting. For instance, like Rust, at least, even though it's kind of, it's boring in a lot of ways, but it also kind of brings some very interesting kind of new things to the table, kind of a good mashup, while with Dart, it was just like, eh. So, <laughs> but if you know, like, but I, I do kind of, it might be just that I was um, um, too super, uh, kind of not, not um, spending enough time looking at it. So if you know some kind of cool dark features, the floor is yours. I think it's like it would be an ideal future, but I don't think it's realistic. I, also, I think it's kind of it's good that it actually we still have JavaScript because you don't kind of it's still like you just type in your console in the browser and program it. And this is like one of the few vestiges of where everyone can kind of hack on your device without having any environment or anything like that. So I think it's like and also it just kind of probably more approachable, there's just so much momentum behind it, and all these languages have various kind of different trade-offs. So I think it's always going to be this kind of dynamic of having a very popular movement, popular technology on the one hand, and then as a reaction to it, it's going to see more kind of specialized niche tools to overcome some of the problems. Maybe some of those will kind of become mainstream, but they also, with that, they're going to lose some of its, some of what made them special, and they're going to have another, circle, another cycle and so forth. Uh, now we kind of, uh, now we have uh, getting the dirty looks. Um, which I think we need to. Uh, you, I started the coffee break, so maybe one more question. Okay, and then otherwise just uh, track me down. I'll be here all day if you want to kind of talk about this further.
can you divide the code when what is run is different from what you wrote? Uh, m most of these languages kind of use source maps, so it's it's still sometimes it's nasty. Um, there are, and there are going to be like various corner cases in implementation and stuff like that. So it's there are sometimes it's not going to be smooth sailing. Most of it is. Um, also, like a lot of these languages have its kind of its own layer of tooling built upon, so you don't necessarily always need to even drop down to uh, JavaScript and debuggers in JavaScript, which also sim simplifies it. But you should have at least kind of a passing familiarity with JavaScript to figure out what's going on, because yes, sometimes you will end up in some stack trace ending in JavaScript. Right. Well, thank you for your attention and. Yeah.